Do we have too much government? We need to put uh, people in ahead of corporate profits. This system is so lopsided. This threat is a real threat to democracy. And I think that's really important. That's something we haven't been doing in this country for a long time. Where do you start? What do you do? How do you do it? Access to Democracy and other Egan Community Television programming is supported by Thomson Reuters, makers of Westlaw Next and based in Egan. Through Westlaw Next and other innovative online services, Thomson Reuters is the world's leading source of intelligent information for businesses and professionals. Online at ThomsonReuters.com and by U.S. Federal Credit Union, the member-owned financial institution offering service, value, and experience you can trust to the greater Twin Cities community. What do you do? How do you do it? Where do you start? You start with access to democracy. You start with a return guest, Mike Obermuller, uh, who ran a valiant race for Congress in 2012. And Mike, is there an announcement that you would like to make today? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, we uh, were very proud of the effort that we put in, in last year. and. We Drove a po we had a positive, uh, issue-centered campaign, and we were happy with that. And thousands of volunteers came out to make sure that we had uh, an, uh, uh, an effort focused on making more out of our Congress, more better people who do have better results. And uh, I'm afraid that uh, the work didn't get done the way we were hoping it would at the time, but there's no quitting the farm boy here, so I'm, uh, I'm stepping off again. It's time to finish the job we started with the folks that uh, helped get us here in the first place, and I'm going to run for Congress again in 2014. Well. Good news and uh, happy to have the announcement come here. Uh, you've been here quite a few times in the past. You served in the legislature. But let's take it back to the beginning here. Uh, you have a really interesting story uh, about your childhood on a dairy form farm in Wisconsin. So let's start there. Yeah, I mean, it all, it's really the reason I'm running for Congress is the life that I've had uh, that's kind of led me to this point. I, I grew up on this little family dairy farm, uh, six adopted kids in my family. I guess my parents were saints, uh, taking in which, all those which things. Which is an amazing story in and of itself. Right, and my, my mom was a teacher, and my dad was obviously a farmer, and, and uh, they really both pushed us hard on education to make sure that we, uh, that, you know, that their kids were all going to go to college and, and uh, make something of their lives, which is exactly what you want to see parents happen. And, it was, uh, you know, it was tough times in the 80s being on a farm, and, and uh, there were times where money was a little thin, and that's, that's something that form, uh, you know, had an impact on my life. And I, I want to make sure that we've got a chance, uh, now that I you know, have made it through my life, I'm a, I'm a lawyer and I've been successful, I've had a chance to have a, a part in the American dream, and, and I want to make sure other people have that too. And, uh, and I went off to college, and I met my wife on the very first day of school. I, uh, I fell in love right away, and we went out. And you're that supposed to sign up for your courses that day. Yeah, I tell you, I, I, it was my work-study job at the cafeteria, and she was working, and I was smitten from day one. And, and uh, you know, she, she somehow graced me with a, a date that Friday, and we've been together ever since, married 19 years now. We've got two great boys that uh, went to local public schools here. One's in college now. And, um, you know, we've talked about this, I think, on past shows, that, you know, when you're going through college uh, and you've got a family, it's, it's tight. I mean, I, I can remember that first Christmas after my son Greg was born, um, there were some times where the, it was, if the Elks hadn't shown up with a box of food, I'm not sure how we would have uh, how we eaten that Christmas, that Christmas break. But uh, those things, you know, we, we didn't do it alone. There was a community there that was committed to making sure that our family was successful, just like their families were successful. And, uh, I'm not going to uh, stand on the sidelines while we have a, a, a system that seems to be taking apart the community success that we've had, and I, I want to give back now, so I'm going to serve. Well, your story is, is so different from the story of the incumbent who really has had government jobs his entire life, uh, 25 years in the service, albeit, you know, really, really uh, to his credit. Uh, his wife also was in the service at the same time. They have both retired from the service, and then he stepped right into Congress. So it's been a situation of being on 
necessarily the government's dole his entire life, and yet he doesn't seem to relate that to the problems that people are going through individually now. Yeah, and, and I respect Congressman Klein's service both in the in the in Congress and in his <coughs> military service. I I appreciate that, and I think it's just a disconnect between. Uh, what it's like to be someone who's really having to struggle with their family to make things uh, work in terms of feeding their family and making sure that uh, you get the bills paid. And uh, there are a lot of families who've had a similar story to mine that uh, you know struggle to put your kids through college and then you hope they move on and, and do the same thing to work hard to better themselves to be a, a little bit higher on the economic scale than, than you were. And my parents did that for me and, th and now we're trying to do it for my kids as well. A dairy farm uh, especially a small family dairy farm is not generally something that you associate with millionaire living. <laughs> That's definitely the case. And I, you know, in, in my case, it was uh, lots of long hours uh, out there. And you know, it's the one thing I did learn is that you don't leave a job half done. So we worked late in the evening to finish a project, and that's uh, uh, a skill that I've transformed into my lawyer career. And, and now I'm going to, you know, hopefully transform here because I, I think the job of getting better representation in Congress starts with sending better people there and people who have a focus on the right priorities. And uh, this job isn't done, and, and now I'm, I'm hoping to get the job done. And people who have a focus on the people that they represent. People who can relate to the people that they represent. People who express the values of the people that they represent. We're at a time where salaries have not gone up for the middle class. In fact, if you really factor in inflation, salaries have gone down in the last decade for the middle class. At the same time, CEOs are getting richer and richer and richer. Golden parachutes are unbelievable. Uh, I mentioned on another show uh, that Tubby Smith got fired as a coach and got a $2.5 million buyout. There are a lot of people who can't even relate to that in terms of how much money that they'll make in their lifetime. So obviously we need a mentality in Congress that relates to the majority of the people and their needs. Yep, and that's, that's really got to be the focus to be <clears throat> successful. I mean, this, this American dream that we're all trying to be part of um, is not an individual who pokes through and managed to make it to the top. It's a chance for all of us to have the same opportunity to be successful and for all of us to be moving along. And uh, what we've done now is, in a, as a society is we've essentially attacked the middle class and cut out the ability for folks to have uh, a real chance to make it into the middle class. We've got you know, a widening divide between the folks who are very, very wealthy and the folks who are not as well off. Uh, and our focus, if you want to have strong economic growth, we, you got to have a middle class to go out and spend the dollars in those stores. And that, you know, they get paid, they spend that money out there, and it creates more jobs. That's where the, that's where the, the, the focus on economic f uh, future is. So uh, we, we really have to take a laser focus on the things that will actually help us uh, move our economy forward and, and move our country forward instead of spending a lot of time on some satellite issues. And we hear a lot from the Chamber of Commerce about the small business owner and the pressure on the small business owner and taxes uh, on corporations affecting the small business owner. And I just heard a statistic that 80% of the small businesses aren't even corporations. So we're talking about apples and oranges. We're talking about things that don't relate. What we want to do for the small business owner is give him the ability to create jobs and he can do that by people working and having money to spend. And that's just the wrong way that we've been going about it in this country for the last decade. Yeah, I mean obviously we've, we've <coughs> taken a, a chance with our tax code to give uh, this little break for that person and this little incentive to that person and a lot of that needs to be cleaned out. We got a lot of loopholes in there that need to be cleaned out. Uh, a fair tax system is one that's progressive so as you make more you pay more taxes because uh, if you've got more of discretionary income or uh, you, whether it's with your business or with uh, your family uh, you can afford that more and, and to be part of giving back. But uh, we really need to streamline those things and really focus in on it. But again it's not, it's not really going to come down to just um, you know whether we have more or, or less it's about what our priorities are and what our focus is going to be on trying to actually make sure that we have the kind of country we want 
uh, where people have a chance if they play by the rules to be successful and that's really where the focus is and instead what we've done is uh, focus in on partisanship and we've seen a lot of a lot of uh, people you know kind of butting heads out there for the purpose of butting heads and positioning themselves just so they could be um, in, in an absolute position well it's it's pretty easy to be absolute if you never talk to someone who doesn't agree with you <laughs> We need people talking across the aisle and actually getting the job done, and, and we just haven't sent the right kind of people there to get that job done. You managed to do that when you were in the House, uh, the Minnesota House of Representatives, so uh, I yeah. would think there's no reason to think you couldn't attempt that when you're in Congress. Well, it, it, has, to, it has to be a focus of yours. It, it has to, you have to want to find out what the other side thinks and find ways to compromise and find ways to get there. And it will be a focus of mine. I, I made a point of making sure we had bipartisan support for things that I worked on in the, in the Capitol at, when I was at, in St. Paul. And uh, it'll be a focus of mine going forward if I get a chance to serve in, in D.C. as well. Now, you're going to run in 2014 for Congress. Uh, the president is still in office until 2016. What do you think a Democratic Congress could help this president, assuming that the Senate stays the same, could help this president accomplish in two years, and what would you like to see and be a part of? Well, certainly there's a lot of work we could do to make sure that college is more affordable. Uh, we've got some work to do with how our Pell Grants are done and whether Stafford loans and so forth are going to be available. I think we need to make big steps forward on immigration reform uh, to find a path that uh, helps bring people out of, this, uh, out of the shadows uh, and get them into productive jobs where everybody uh, is on a level playing field because um, it's good for businesses to have a level playing field like that and it's good for people as well. Um, the, the long is, it wouldn't be, it's not a power grab to have the opportunity, but to, put, but to put forward an agenda where we can afford to have everybody have, where everybody has affordable health care, to where everybody has a chance for a reasonable job and there's a, there's a strong middle class. That's the kind of agenda that uh, a, a Democratic majority in the House would have and that's what I'd like to be a part of. The amazing thing to me about health care is that whether it's universal health care or single payer, which I happen to endorse, and you look at the other countries around the world, they are paying so much less for their health care. The results are not necessarily less. You hear these stories about people waiting three months to get a doctor's appointment, and frankly, uh, uh, my response to that is you can step into a uh, really into a farmyard and step into the same thing that that uh, <laughs> represents and uh, <clears throat> reminds me of the uh, Harry Truman story where he was uh, traveling around in a farm and every place he went there was a guy in the background yelling Hoogar, Hoogar and finally he, he got to one of the people that brought him out for the talk and he said what is this guy who's talking about Hugar? And he said, just be careful you don't step in it, Mr. President. <laughs> and we get so much of that in politics now that uh, it, it, it's depressing to me. It's depressing that people will ignore the needs of their citizens, the needs of the people who elected them because of catering to lobbyists. Healthcare is a perfect example. We have insurance companies running healthcare and people's needs are not being met monetarily. If we had one of these forms, if we really endorsed the Affordable Care Act and made it go forward, it would lower our costs so, so much that we could do so much more with the billions of dollars that we would save. Right, and we've spent a lot of time, unfortunately, in our, in our house, uh, in the U.S. House, um, you know, trying to repeal this. It's, it's the law. And people are happy with the fact that we don't have pre-existing conditions that can rule you out of coverage anymore. They're, make, they're happy the fact that their 25 or 26 year old child can stay on their health insurance when they can't get their own. You're a perfect example of that. Exactly right. And, you know, and we, we have this opportunity now to expand on it and do the things that it's missing. I, I think it doesn't do enough to help control the cost by helping to focus in on keeping people healthy. That's something we should be moving forward on. Um, but th to continue this fight over and over again for political purposes to say uh, we're going to try to repeal this, we're going to keep trying to stop, th that's not the right approach. We ought to be focusing on the future going and, and really making that, our, that the primary focus. So. Well, we, we have to stop, in my estimation, focusing on these niche issues and really look toward what's important. To me, what's important is public safety, what's important is education, what's important is jobs. Those are the things that drive us forward. 
Uh, yes, we want our communities to be safe, but at the same time, we want our children to get a good education. And let's talk about uh, Congressman Klein in that regard, because he chairs an education committee in the House. Right, and uh, unfortunately has not done a very good job of reaching across the <coughs> aisle to find some compromise on things. And that's why you don't see a replacement bill to No Child Left Behind co uh, coming out of his committee that has bipartisan support. Uh, recently had uh, the, the Democrats uh, in his committee walk out of his committee because he was bringing forward a, a program to, to reform workforce that was uh, that they considered was so partisan that they couldn't even stay in the room to, to listen to the, to the effort. And, it's an attitude towards this is the way I'm going to do it as opposed to this is the way we could do it together and let's get your input. And they I think call that's it arrogance. Well, it, it's, 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 it's got to be your goal to reach across and find common, common ground with people. If, if that's not your goal, you're, you're not going to be successful at doing it. So I, I think that's really where a focus has to be. My way or the highway will not work in a system where the two houses are run by different parties. The majorities are different parties, and that's a perfect example. <clears throat> Another thing that's been tearing up our society lately is talk about guns. Now, we have talked, you know I'm a gun owner, and I know you're a gun owner, right. and uh, I don't have an AR-15 uh, <laughs> with 1,300 shells in the house and long-range clips. Uh, I don't feel the need for it. Uh, we have spent millions and tens of millions of dollars on this issue. I would think that after the Newtown tragedy, it would not be a question about it. It's a no-brainer. Uh, where do you stand? for instance, on registration and things like that. Sure. Well, you know, I just to, to <coughs> kind of the broader point on this is there, there's nothing wrong with people. Uh, law-abiding people having guns. You and I both have them, and that's fine. The real question is, and I, I think it goes back to an officer I talked to once who said, I, wanna, I, want to, uh, I want the bad guy to have to reload before I do. And that really stuck with me as, as a goal. It, it, it's one thing, you know, the design of the gun, we talk about whether it's an assault weapon or something like that, but that, that's less important to me than the size of that clip, and that's something we need to really think about in terms of does it make sense to have 30, 30 bullets in a clip, and do you really need that for any reason other than for looking at it? But I mean, if you're going to need 30 bullets to take down a deer, <laughs> Uh, maybe you should find another avocation. Yeah, and look, there's, there's people who collect these, and, that, and I understand that's not a, a passion that I have, but other people do. I, I can respect that. But the, the real question <laughs> for us is, is there something we can do to help make sure that the people we don't want to have guns, people who are not uh, in a mental position, that, or, you know, mental capacity that they should have those, that we could be working on? And, and there's, uh, you know, very strong public support for universal background checks, and uh, the Which details all have to be worked. Seem to be a no-brainer, right? And the details all have to be worked out to make it work. But uh, this is uh, this is a spot where you really you could be uh, you could find some common ground, and they won't even focus on that issue because they want to. It seems like the two sides seem to be fighting more on on uh, their own their own plan plans rather than actually talking about things they could find common ground on. And this is. It's, it's really a no-brainer to make sure that we've got a system that actually works to keep the guns out of people who shouldn't have, their hand, have them in their hands. And health care we touched on briefly. I glanced down at my notes and I see I wrote down here the Affordable Car Act. Yeah. <laughs> I think everybody should have an affordable car. <laughs> but affordable right. care and uh, what's your feeling do, there? Yeah, well look, we, it's, it's implementing, we're working on it now. Uh, the state uh, is starting to implement its plans to see how this actually will work and putting the, putting the meat on the bones of this, uh, of this law. Uh, there are people who are still really concerned about it and that's fine. We should have an honest debate about whether things are working and whether they're actually c controlling costs. But the focus has to be on the health care, on, on helping people make sure that they get health care that's affordable and that it gets the job done to keep them healthy. And uh, you keeps know, them out of the emergency keeps rooms them. where it costs 10 times as much and where everybody's premiums go up because of all the uninsured right. people. We, we pay for that care anyway. So we rather, mm -hmm. we'd much rather have them go to a family doctor and, and do it at a much lower cost. And that, that's really where our focus has to be on. And, and as we continue on with implementing what's going on there, and uh, it's got to be everybody at the table. It can't just be uh, the, the federal government making its decisions. It can't just be a local doctor. It's got to be the insurance companies are going to have a role to play in the, in the near future on this to make sure that we actually can tr control the cost. But we also have to extract out the, the kinds of things. You, you probably saw that we had uh, 
the the, the nonprofit uh, CEOs here are getting get paid a lot of money in this in this state for the healthcare companies. Millions we, of we've dollars. We've seen the the insurance companies actually uh, taking more money in than they really actually need to cover their losses. And those are things that we, it's time to step up and make sure that we 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 do because. Like everything else, if people don't trust that their dollars are being used wisely, uh, they don't want to let them out the door to go do things for someone else. And so we want to make sure that every dollar is used efficiently and that people can look at it and say, I have faith in the, in the way uh, these folks are spending the money. Um, that makes it a little easier to ask them when we have to for, for some additional funds. Now, we had a lot of trouble in Congress this year getting an agriculture bill. There were filibusters, everything else. How important is agriculture to our society and to the growth of our society. Well, it's huge. And this is one of the, the examples that you could hold up as kind of the, the biggest embarrassments, really, uh, in terms of in, uh, against bipartisanship that they did. This bill, the Farm Bill, last time around, passed the Senate, it passed the House Committee with broad bipartisan support, and then couldn't even get to the House floor for a vote. And the things that are in this bill uh, help farmers. It's insurance programs to make sure that if there's a drought that the, that the uh, there's money there to help backstop them so they can plant the next year because if they don't plant the next year then there's there's no corn or there's no soybeans and those are the things that are in a lot of the food and then and what happens to prices in the next year they go skyrocket, up right. right and uh, but another big chunk of that bill of course has to do with uh, with uh, the the need for people who are on food stamps essentially and uh, that the ability to get that uh, the program the dollars the snap program is what it's called but the to get those dollars into hands of people who are you know three-year-olds and and uh, seniors who are hungry and uh, to be holding that up for for purely political purposes is just an embarrassment it shows that that congress is frankly broken it's and a lack of conscience is what it is and uh, <clears throat> and i'm not ashamed to say that mm -hmm. another thing that's really troubling to me is we have a backup in the veterans affairs department it was bad four years ago, and it has gotten so much worse that veterans have to wait almost a year to get an appointment now. With the department that's still working with boxes of paper rather than a working computerization, how does something like that happen, and why can't we take steps to really protect the people who are protecting us, yeah, well, absolutely. the bravest and the finest. Right, and absolutely we can take those steps. It's just you have to set prior you have to make it a priority to do it because we've found plenty of money uh, to help set off and do these the wars, and now we've got those folks coming back and they need medical care. Um, a lot of folks with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and other issues that, uh, that, that are going to need long-term care going forward. Um, and we've got to make sure that we take good care of those. We, we, we've made a commitment to them, and we're going to stand by that commitment. Uh, I'm absolutely confident of that. But it's time to start fixing the, the problems in the system that make it harder for them to get to that care. Um, and that, that's a big issue for us, because we've, these, these people are, are relying on us like we've been relying on them. And, you know, uh, we can talk about the, really, the value of, I, I wouldn't even say the value of the war, but the wisdom of going into these two wars, uh, both of which I opposed. But we have gotten out of Iraq, so to speak, and uh, we are moving to get out of Afghanistan. I don't know how any of this is going to really play out with, with some of the craziness that's going on in the world. but. Those are trillions of dollars, and yet the veterans are languishing without, and, and suicides among veterans are literally dozens a day of our returning veterans. Uh, that too, to me, is unconscionable. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you there, and, and uh, figuring out a way to help these men and women who have done so much for us is, is, is a crucial focus. And again, it's, it's really about whether you're going to have the, the right priorities. And when we spend time talking about, uh, you know, whether we're going to have a huge, this loophole or that loophole and whether it's, you know, too, too much stress on a business to, to close that one or open this one, um, we're really losing focus on the actual thing that matters, which is the people that are being impacted by those decisions. Because if you, if you don't have the, if you put your funds in, in point A instead of point B and it, it hurts people, that's an impact. And we got to have focus who are, people who are ready to focus in on the things that actually matter in there. How important has the union movement been in building our middle class society? Well, I, you know, I've had an opportunity to meet, uh, you know, hundreds of men and women who are members of unions, and uh, they oftentimes joke with me about I'm the union thug that's uh, that uh, everybody warns you about, and and 
th these are people living their lives, and they, uh, the unions had a chance uh, when, when things were not good in our, in our workplaces, when it was dangerous to go to work, uh, and it was, uh, wages were so low you couldn't feed your families. The unions, people coming together and forming unions and, and negotiating for those better services really helped build the middle class in the first place. And uh, now we've seen under attack because of the political uh, nature of things. The rank and file men and women in those unions are family members. They're moms, they're dads, they're, some of them are, are uh, trying to raise kids. They're trying to uh, make sure that they uh, put their kids through college just like I'm trying to do. And they understand that the, the goal isn't to talk about being in their union. It's about making sure that we've got livable wages. It's about making sure that health care is affordable so their kid can go to the doctor when he or, when he or she is sick. It's about uh, making sure that the middle class doesn't just evaporate and all we have is the folks at the very high end and the folks at the very low end. and Which would really be destructive to our democracy or our Republican government. And I say that Republican as a republic, not Republican right. government. Right, and, and that's, it's, <clears throat> it's crucial to make sure, and, and not just union members, because they, they have been impacted by their individual contracts, but they, w they bring up the standard of living for a lot of people around them as well. Um, and I think, you know, it's not, it doesn't, no business owner has to be anti-union. I mean, people choose to be sometimes, but they don't have to be because uh, the goal ought to be for all of us to be doing better. And when you have, you know, well-qualified workers, they're well-trained, uh, they're making a living wage, they're happier, they're working harder, that can be productive for your business as well. And I think most business owners can really see the benefit of that. And, and that's why I think we've, you know, really got to stop, we got to stop focusing on, the focusing on the politics of this thing and start looking at the, the people behind it, which is a lot of people trying to be successful in life. And unions have done so much, minimum wage, 40-hour week, paid vacations, lunch hour, benefits. I mean, when we were doing the best, unions represented about 25% of the workforce. Now it's under 10% of the workforce. And uh, I, I don't understand the disconnect with that mentality, but uh, there are a lot of things I don't understand. Yeah. One thing I do understand is that Mike Obermuller has come back to access to democracy today, and uh, he has made a major announcement. And do you want to repeat that in the few sure. seconds we have left? Yep. I'm very proud to be saying that uh, with the many, many people who stepped up to help our last effort, uh, we're going to finish the job together, and we're going to. I'm going to run for Congress in 2014, and we're going to do our best to put some real representation in in D.C. from this district again, which I'm really excited about. The second congressional district is smiling today, and Mike, good luck. Come back and talk to us as you move forward with the campaign, and with your plans, and with the many things obviously in the society that we didn't get a chance to talk about today. So thank you. Yes, thank you, Alan.